Good afternoon. My name is Brian Darty, and I'm a Associate Professor of History at Virginia Commonwealth University and a member of the Board of Directors of the Virginia Forum. I'd like to welcome you all to today's session, the third of four virtual Virginia Forums sponsored by the Virginia Forum and also the Library of Virginia. I'd like to begin by thanking the Library of Virginia for this very important and helpful partnership. It's been an excellent experience offering thus far two virtual sessions, which are available as recordings on the Library of Virginia's YouTube channel and also sponsoring today's session as well. Jonathan, if you'll circulate the slide. The Virginia Forum is an educational association that sponsors an annual conference focusing on Virginia studies and incorporating the scholarship and presentations of a variety of academics and volunteers and scholars that deal with all aspects of Virginia history, archaeology, literary studies, uh, and so forth, scholarship in general. Slide, please. We're very excited to announce and to be promoting our next Virginia Forum, which will take place in person in Richmond, Virginia in early April, sponsored by the Virginia War Memorial. For more information, please visit the virtual, uh, excuse me, the Virginia Forum website or our Facebook page. As mentioned, we've already hosted two virtual sessions. Today's session, as you can see, titled Fighting for Freedom, Black Activism in the Civil War Era, Lower Shenandoah Valley, is going to be taking place for the next hour. And I also ask you to please join us for our fourth session, scheduled, as you can see, for Friday, September the 17th at 12 noon. That session is titled Family Values Tropes and the Struggle for LGBTQ Plus Equality in Virginia. It is my pleasure to now introduce today's two presenters in the order of their presentations. Dr. Jonathan Noyalis is director of Shenandoah University's McCormick Civil War Institute and the founding editor of the Journal of the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War era. Dr. Noyalis is a professor in the history department at Shenandoah University. He is the author or editor of 14 books, including most recently, Slavery and Freedom in the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War era, published by the University of Florida Press in 2021. Noyalis has authored more than 100 articles, essays, book chapters, and reviews for a variety of scholarly and popular publications. In addition to teaching and writing, Noyalis has consulted on various public history projects with organizations such as the National Park Service, the American Battlefield Trust, Shenandoah Valley Battlefield's National Historic District, and National Geographic. Moyales has appeared on NPR's With Good Reason, C-SPAN's American History TV, and PCN. He is the recipient of numerous awards for his teaching and scholarship, including the highest honor that can ever be bestowed upon anyone teaching at a college or university in Virginia, the State Council for Higher Education in Virginia's Outstanding Faculty Award. Dr. Jonathan Berkey is a professor of history at Concord University, Athens, West Virginia. He received his PhD and MA from Pennsylvania State University and his BA from Gettysburg College. He has contributed scholarship on the Civil War's impact on Shenandoah Valley civilians to several publications, including The Civil War and the Transformation of American Citizenship, edited by Paul Quigley, The Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1862, edited by Gary Gallagher, and Enemies of the Country, edited by John Inisco and Robert Kenzer. He is completing a study examining how civilians waged war in Virginia's lower Shenandoah Valley currently. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Noyales and Dr. Jonathan Berkey. Well, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. And I'd like to also thank the Virginia Forum and the Library of Virginia uh, for hosting this session. And it's always a great pleasure 
uh, to be having a, a presentation with my good friend, Jonathan Berkey. As Virginia militia marched through Charlestown, Virginia, now West Virginia, en route to Harper's Ferry in the spring of 1861, Unionist David Hunter Strother stood amongst the crowd of hundreds of individuals. But Strother focused less on the troops and more on the free blacks and enslaved people who watched the spectacle unfold. And to David Hunter Strother, it appeared to him that the enslaved and free blacks had a look of wonder on their faces, sort of pondering how what was unfolding before their very eyes might in some ways affect them. And he thought, and he wrote, I could discern in the eyes of some a gleam of anxious speculation, a silent and tremulous questioning of the future. In the early months of the Civil War, the Shenandoah Valley's enslaved needed to best determine how to use the conflict as an instrument to seize their freedom. Some, such as a contingent of 19 enslaved people and one unidentified white male from Massachusetts, believe that insurrection was the best route. Unfortunately, their effort on May 26, 1861 had failed as Confederate forces in the area subdued it rather quickly. Other enslaved in individuals simply decided that they should bolt from their enslavers. And the evidence indicates that hundreds of enslaved human beings from the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley escaped for Pennsylvania during the conflict's opening months. Now, while some enslaved people might have been motivated simply to leave because of the overall opportunity that the general chaos of war created, others were motivated to flee because of the prospect of being moved or sold. Whatever the motivation, sources indicate really a steady stream of enslaved people leaving the Shenandoah Valley for the Keystone State and beyond. Uh, a newspaper reporter from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on June 7th, 1861 reported that over 100 fugitives from labor from the neighborhood of Winchester arrived here on Wednesday and Thursday nights. But not all of the valleys enslaved believed that insurrection or bolting for freedom was really the best path to securing freedom at the war's outset. Enslaved individuals such as Frederick County's John Quincy Adams, he noted that his father believed that it was best to remain, labor for the enslaver, and wait until conditions stabilized a bit more. For this more pragmatic contingent of the valley's enslaved population, it seemed that the best opportunity to flee appeared when Union General Robert Patterson approached the region in mid-June of 1861. Of course, by the time that Patterson entered the valley, Union General Benjamin Butler had given refuge to enslaved people who were seeking his protection at Fortress Monroe. Now, how aware the valleys enslaved were about Butler's contraband order is unclear. But as Patterson's army marched into Jefferson County, which today, of course, is in West Virginia, it did not take long for the areas enslaved to learn of the presence of these United States troops and to appeal to them for protection. Now, while hopeful, when one of the enslaved males approached a Union soldier and asked if this was not the army that was come to set them free, the soldier he encountered, a soldier from Massachusetts, replied with an emphatic no. And actually this Massachusetts soldier told this group of enslaved individuals to set you free or to do anything contrary to the law of the land is not our mission. After this little exchange, this Massachusetts soldier told this group of enslaved to return immediately to their enslavers. Well, scenes such as this one, they continued on a daily basis during Patterson's tenure in the Valley, which ended on July 25th, 1861. Now, during the time that Patterson was in command, he ordered that all enslaved people who fled to Union lines should be immediately returned or jailed until their enslavers could be located. Of course, Patterson's decision to not do, to, to do this was not a unilateral one, but it kept with larger military policy at the time. However, to some of the individuals in Patterson's command, 
This seemed unconscionable and quite frankly, militarily unwise. One of those individuals who shared his perspectives about this was Lieutenant Robert Gould Shaw, who later went on to command the 54th Massachusetts. Well, in the summer of 1861, Shaw served in the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry. And he believed that if the United States Army, not only in the Valley, but elsewhere, employed freedom seekers, that it would restore the Union more expeditiously. And he wrote a letter home to his parents. And he said that the United States Army needs to make use of the instrument that would finish the war sooner than anything else, the slaves. What a look it would be at them to call on all the blacks in the country to come and to enlist in our army. Now, despite the fact that some of the valleys enslaved were aware of Patterson's program, aware of what he was doing to runaway slaves, they tried to escape anyway. But with the intent of offering various services to Union soldiers in exchange for their freedom. There were some individuals who thought that the best thing they could offer Patterson was military intelligence. So for example, during Patterson's time in the vicinity of Martinsburg, Virginia, now West Virginia, there was an enslaved man who simply identified to us by the name of George, encountered pickets from the 11th Pennsylvania near the small little hamlet of Darksville, which is located in the Southern part of Berkeley County. And he asked to be sent, he has to be taken to Patterson's headquarters in Martinsburg because he had information about Confederate forces around Winchester. So those Pennsylvania soldiers, they took him to Patterson's headquarters. He revealed what he knew about the dispositions of General Joseph E. Johnston's army around Winchester, the defenses of that city. And after he was done divulging all of that, Patterson promptly locked him up in the jail in Martinsburg so that he could be returned to his enslaver. To the chaplain of the 11th Pennsylvania, this was just mind boggling. How could you do this? And Locke recorded, in reward for revealing what he knew, he was sent to the guardhouse and confined as a runaway slave. Now, Patterson's practices, of course, did not sit well with anti-slave leaning members of Congress when reports of this type of activity reached Congressman Owen Lovejoy, he was appalled. And it prompted him on July 8, 1861 to introduce a resolution condemning Patterson's practices. And it urged the House of Representatives to pass a resolution to shift union policy, to not engage in arresting enslaved people and returning them to enslavers. Lovejoy's resolution, which passed by a vote of 93 to 55 the following day, it demanded that it is no part of the duty of the soldiers of the United States to capture and return fugitive slaves. But it's important to understand that this was a resolution. It was merely a condemnation of practices such as Patterson's and not law. 16 days after Lovejoy's resolution, General Nathaniel P. Banks replaced Patterson in the Lower Shenandoah Valley. Now, when Banks arrived at Harper's Ferry, his primary concern was to take measures to prevent Maryland's secession. But General Banks could not ignore the valleys enslaved. Now, at that moment that Banks took command of what was known as the Department of the Shenandoah, official military policy still dictated, despite Lovejoy's resolution, that United States soldiers return runaway slaves or detain them. But that all changed two weeks later when President Abraham Lincoln signed the first Confiscation Act. Now, whether or not news of the first Confiscation Act trickled down to the Shenandoah Valley's enslaved population or not is unclear. But enslavers such as Winchester's Benjamin F. Brooke, he noted that by the end of the second week of August, that those whom he enslaved appeared defined in a manner not yet exhibited up to this point in the conflict. Now, while some enslaved might have become more assertive after that first confiscation act, it might have prompted others to believe that the time was indeed right to flee to General Banks's camps near Harper's Ferry. But it's important to understand that the decision to flee correlates directly with their proximity to General Banks's army. 
So we don't have accurate records during the final months of 1861 as to how many enslaved people came to Harper's Ferry, but we do have records in the earliest months of 1862, noting how many enslaved people on a daily basis were coming in to Harper's Ferry. And if you look, for instance, at the records from February and March of 1862, nearly 60% of the enslaved people who made it to Harper's Ferry came from Jefferson County, which of course Harper's Ferry sits in Jefferson County with the remaining 40% coming from neighboring Clark, Berkeley and Frederick counties. Now, when freedom seekers arrived at Harper's Ferry on this daily basis, they provided Union soldiers with all kinds of stories of enslavers barbarities. And you can read some of those excerpts I've pulled from these reports on the screen. But other enslaved people carried information about things such as the Confederate defenses of Winchester. One of the handful of enslaved people who came to Harper's Ferry and provided information about Confederate defenses around Winchester was Dennis Taylor. He was an enslaved man about 25 years old who escaped his enslaver who lived about five miles north of Winchester. And Taylor offered a very detailed description of one of the most formidable earthworks, what you see there on the screen, constructed around Winchester in the early months of the conflict, it was known as Fort Collier. And there you can see on the screen as one of Banks' soldiers recorded it, Taylor's description not only of Fort Collier, but also some of the defenses east of Winchester along the Berryville Pike. Now, while reports such as these aided Banks as he moved from Harper's Ferry to Winchester in late February and early March, the movement of 35,000 United States soldiers against a locality defended by 3,500 Confederates helped enslaved people who opted to remain with enslavers up to this point in the conflict reconsider their pragmatism. During the war's first 11 months, two enslaved people from Jefferson County simply identified to us as Aunt Chloe and her son George, believed that it was best to stay put. Although the sight of a massive United States Army marching south did little to dissuade Aunt Chloe, her son George believed the opportunity for freedom was now, and so he fled. While the Valley's enslaved would have to wait and see how events played out in 1862, there were some in Banks's command, particularly those who had spent much of the conflict in the valley, believed that as armies marched south, more of the valleys enslaved would follow George's example. To Major Wilder Dwight of the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry, he thought that the leaven is working, there is no stopping it. While the leaven indeed might have been working by the early part of 1862 and inspired some such as George to flee, it proved temporary. Now, although George's fate is unknown, some who sought safety with United States forces in the early spring of 1862 found themselves captured by Confederates and either returned to their enslavers or impressed into the Confederacy service. The Civil War's first 12 months proved an instructive moment for the Valley's enslaved. They began to understand that freedom would not occur in one fell swoop nor would it be permanently safeguarded. Freedom was always contingent on proximity to United States forces, but also personal circumstance, belief in potential for success and trust. Over the conflict's next three years, life for the Lower Valley's enslaved would remain difficult as they continued to navigate a very complex world, one in which they balanced their desire for freedom and impulse to support the war to destroy slavery with that basic instinct for survival. So at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Jonathan Berkey, who's gonna take you to a period after the war in the lower part of the Shenandoah Valley. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Brian, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to the forum for, for hosting us. And I, I believe, Jonathan, I'm gonna ask you some questions here uh, before uh, I get into to, to my uh, topic. Uh, and so one of the things I, I was curious about is what do you think would be the biggest challenge that slaves faced at the beginning of the war? 
in, in the Valley? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge and, and what really leads to the, to the pragmatism exhibited by, by so many, and it's hard to quantify, um, is what happens if you make it to Pennsylvania? You know, what is that next step? And I always tell um, individuals, you know, whether they're students or in a, in a public forum like this, the desire for an enslaved person to be free, it is there. Um, but it's but it's how do you make that happen? And you can you can flee. And certainly, you know, individuals in this part of the of the Shenandoah Valley are so close to the Pennsylvania border. You're so close to free territory. But even if you're able to successfully make it to the Keystone State or even beyond, well, what what do you do when you're there? How are you going to be received? Because you know, as we know, um, even though you have a state like Pennsylvania is a free state there's still all kinds of, you know, racial animosity toward, uh, toward black people. So I, I would say that just overall that, that fear of what's next, you know, what do I do after I make that decision to bolt? And there are these um, instances, you know, beyond what my little paper discussed here, where you have enslaved people who, who flee and actually end up coming back. You know, they get maybe 15, 20 miles north of a place like Winchester, and then they're thinking about, well, what's going to happen to a family member or a friend, or what's going to happen to me? So that that I would say is is the number one number one concern. You mentioned in, in your presentation uh, evidence of Union soldiers who were kind of outraged at, at Patterson's policies and and Union military policy in general. I was wondering if you found evidence of soldiers who approved of the conservative policies of these generals. I, I mean, uh, as you're aware, you know, there's a lot of scholarship on how experiencing slavery kind of radicalized many Northern soldiers. So I'm curious in the first year of the war, uh, was there a, a fair number of Union soldiers who said, yeah, this is a good thing to be doing? Yeah, there, that certainly is a, is a great question. And, and the answer is yes. Um, you know, you do have those individuals like Shaw, who of course comes from a, a noted abolitionist family in Boston and, and Major Wilder Dwight and others. But you do have instances, and I, I would have to say that it's, it's much more prevalent among the, the ranks of the enlisted that are, are much more in favor of enforcing Patterson's orders than you have you know, the officers who are traditionally coming from a more maybe upper class background, more well-educated background. And I think that holds true throughout the course of the conflict in the Valley. So, I mean, you, you know, as well as I do, there's this, this back and forth and in a place like the lower Valley, it's kind of a revolving door. And, you know, you have individuals who are extremely reluctant to, you know, whether it's enforcing the confiscation acts or later the emancipation proclamation to do so. Um, because you have this, this, this animosity that exists, you have these, you know, white supremacist attitudes that exist, quite frankly, among some Union soldiers who, you know, for example, in 1863 threatened to mutiny if they're forced to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. You mentioned, you know, uh, especially towards the end of your presentation, kind of some lessons that, that African Americans learned, that slaves learned uh, through this first year of experience. And, and again, I was just thinking, I was gonna ask you a question about that, but you handled it so well that, it, that, that I don't want you to repeat yourself. But uh, I wonder about the flip side. Uh, do planters and slaveholders in the Valley, do, do they see what's happening in the same way? Uh, if, if that makes sense, you know, do they sense that slavery is crumbling or, or do you have a sense of, and I know it's kind of generalizing, but how they might feel at the end of 18 or at the end of the first year of the war about the status of their institution? Yeah, I think it depends on, on where you're at in the Valley. Um, I think that there are, are certainly some individuals in the, you know, the lower part of the Shenandoah Valley, the Northern part of the Valley, who kind of maybe have this, this little inkling that, that something is about to change. But I think there's also evidence, and, and, and I kind of point this out in my book, where you have individuals, you know, when Banks is, is in the Valley from, you know, summer of 61 through the spring of 62, and he's allowed to accept, you know, runaway slaves, individuals are coming to him, you know, asking for the return. And he says, well, we can't do that. And so they're kind of oblivious 
Um, you have in the in the southern part of the valley. So we're talking about you know Rockbridge County, Augusta County. Um, the slave trade is going on there well into the mid part of 1864, and so it's almost like you know it's the same same region, but it's almost like a different world um, in that part of the Shenandoah Valley. But but yeah, I, I think certainly there are some who realize in the outset of the at the outset of the war that slavery is is in peril. And I think that's why you have some individuals who are deciding to to sell enslaved people to reap at least some financial reward um, and also or just moving them to other ports, you know, points in Virginia where they feel that they're going to be a little bit maybe better insulated from from the constant influx of of Union soldiers. Great, and I guess the one one question to kind of end on, and this might be a, a little bit of, of repeating, but but just to, to reinforce, uh, as far as maybe the most important lesson that slaves learned through this first year of war, if you had to if if, if you had to kind of you know quantify, what what would you say that would be? Yeah, to me, I think it is it's it's quite simple. Um, freedom, although we think it's easy to define, is ex is extremely tenuous. And, you know, even if you believe that you have, even if you've left and have attained your freedom, it, it's, it's not really stable. I mean, there are instances of enslaved people in the early part of the war who made it to, let's say, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And in 1863, when Lee's army was coming through, you know, en route to what ultimately became the, the Gettysburg campaign, they found themselves in the path of Lee's army captured and brought back south. So I think they understood that that freedom was something quite elusive and very, very tenuous on shaky ground. Well, thank you for answering those questions. It does serve as a nice uh, kind of segue into to my presentation. I'm going to... Uh, uh, so my presentation called This Community is Not Yet Ready for Submission to Negro Insolence, the Bologna Riot, and the Continuing Freedom Struggle in the Lower Shenandoah Valley, uh, narrows the focus of Jonathan's discussion of the African-American experience in the Lower Valley uh, and moves it forward in time. So my geographical focus is on Charlestown in Jefferson County, which as Jonathan uh, noted uh, before, uh, was in Virginia during the time that co was covered in Jonathan's presentation but is in West Virginia during the time covered in my presentation. In 1860, Charlestown was the home to 1,376 people of whom 240 were enslaved. In 1870, the population grew to 1,593 residents, 537 of whom were African-Americans. As we're all aware, uh, many important changes occurred during the uh, decade uh, between 1862, uh, where Jonathan's uh, presentation ended, uh, and 1868, where mine really begins. Uh, obviously, the monumental change of emancipation uh, through the Emancipation Proclamation during the war and then the 13th Amendment became manifest. And despite gaining their freedom, African Americans in the Lower Shenandoah Valley continued to struggle against a white power structure to limit, that strove to limit their rights and keep them in their perceived social place. While many uh, African Americans in Charlestown after the war embraced their newfound status as freedmen, local white residents felt insulted when former slaves asserted the rights. When the novelist and anti slavery reformer, John Townsend Trowbridge embarked on a tour of the South shortly after the end of the Civil War, Charlestown was one of the first stops that he made. A Unionist acquaintance was visiting the town and talked to Townsend and told Townsend that, quote, the war feeling here is like a burning bush with a wet blanket wrapped around it. Looked at from the outside, the fire seems quenched, but just peep under the blanket and there it is all alive and eating in. A few years later in 1868, Freedmen's Bureau agent J.C. Brubaker noted a similar feeling among white residents of Jefferson County. 
He claimed that it was not surprising that former slaveholders were, quote, desirous of maintaining their old positions and authority after emancipation, unquote. In this kind of environment, daily interactions could bring pent up resentments to the surface. This is exactly what happened on July 11th, 1868 in an incident dubbed the Bologna riot by the local press. It was a warm Saturday right after the wheat harvest. Many people were in town to spend their harvest wages. Tensions were running high that morning in Charlestown. Deputy Sheriff J.D. Potterfield spotted a black man who was, according to a local newspaper account, strutting around the streets with a cavalry revolver holstered on the outside of his jacket. After Potterfield arrested him, the man admitted that he planned to use the revolver against a white man who had confronted him in the harvest fields a few days earlier. Tensions reached a breaking point between two and three o'clock that afternoon when some white men sitting on boxes in front of Jacob Brown's store were eating bologna sausages and tossing the casings. One of these care carelessly tossed casings hit a black customer coming out of the store. This customer and a companion confronted the white men. This confrontation quickly escalated to violence. One of the black men was punched and the other hit with a stone. The men got up and ran with the white men in pursuit. When they reached the vicinity of Trussell's store, the black men yelled for help. Their cries drew the attention of about 30 men who possessed, according to a local paper, a tiger-like ferocity. The Charlestown spirit of Jefferson noted that, quote, for several minutes, the Negroes seemed, who seemed greatly enraged stood in the street cursing white men generally, throwing off their coats and daring a conflict, unquote. One of the white men involved in the original confrontation named Codrick didn't like the odds and ran through Trussell's store, escaping through a back exit. About five or six white men who remained tried to speak calmly to the black men who were intent on getting Codrick. Many in the crowd cried, hang him. The Charlestown Virginia Free Press stated that, quote, the Negro element seemed about to melt with fervent heat. So hot was the pursuit of Codrick. It was with difficulty they were kept from taking possession of the store, unquote. When James N. Gallagher, a son of uh, Charlestown newspaper editor, tried to reason with the crowd, John Jackson, who was described as a, quote, stalwart Negro, unquote, struck Gallagher in the head with a rake, knocking him to the ground. After Gallagher got up, a large fight broke out, mainly consisting of men on each side throwing rocks at one another. A complete rock battle raged for a time, the spirit of Jefferson note reported, and furiously the races assailed each other. We are sure we never saw a fight in which so many men were knocked down in so short a space of time, and we sicken as we contemplate the scene of crushed heads and bleeding faces. As the fight continued, more white men began to converge in the area, and after about 10 minutes, sensing that they would soon be outnumbered, the crowd of black men dispersed. The Bologna riot was over. According to local reports, at least five white men and four black men were injured in the riot. Six black rioters were arrested and required to give bond to ensure their appearance at the October meeting of the circuit court. No white men were arrested for their participation in the riot. Reporting on the incident 10 days later, the spirit of Jefferson warned the African-American community, quote, we trust that the lessons of the memorable Saturday will impress them with the importance of keeping themselves in their proper places, unquote. After the open expression of racial tensions faded, Charlestown residents tried to explain why this riot took place. Their effort was reflected 
in the differing views of Charlestown's two newspapers, the Spirit of Jefferson and the Virginia Free Press. A few days after the riot, the Virginia Free Press asserted that the riot was premeditated by black men, quote, under the teaching of Northern emissaries, unquote. The Spirit of Jefferson blamed the riot on the lack of law enforcement in Charlestown and the easy availability of liquor. The riot of Saturday afternoon is traceable to liquor, the paper's editor asserted, for without it, the Negroes never would have assumed the defiant attitude which they did. A letter to the editor of the paper published 10 days after the riot reinforced this view. Whiskey was the cause of that sad occurrence and it can't be disguised, the letter signed Truth asserted. If we had no whiskey shops in our town, we should not have witnessed such disgraceful scenes. While the competing newspapers debated about the motivations of the rioters, they likely seemed to agree on the white response. The spirit of Jefferson noted that on the morning of the riot, black people in town were, quote, moving about the streets with insolent airs and using abusive, obscene, and profane language, unquote. It was this behavior, according to the spirit of Jefferson, that caused the riot. The paper concluded, quote, however the case may be elsewhere, this community is not yet ready for submission to Negro insolence. Despite their varying positions on its cause, the Charlestown newspaper's coverage of the riot implied a common theme. It did not acknowledge the legitimate grievances of African-Americans nor their agency in expressing their frustrations with these grievances. As recent debates over the motivations of black protesters during the summer of 2020 shows, African-Americans continue to struggle to have their legitimate grievances and agency publicly acknowledged. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, one of the things that that you always, or I've heard for a long time, both in terms of you know the, the four years of civil war, as well as the immediate aftermath, um, is that the Shenandoah Valley and the experiences of enslaved people and black people after the war was very, very different than other parts of the South. Clearly, you know, your, your topic, the Bologna riot in Charlestown, in 1868 reveals that in, in many ways, the valley is similar, quite similar to other areas throughout the South. I'm wondering if you could just sort of give a, a brief overview of the historiography and help people understand why this, this attitude persisted for so long that, that slavery looked different in the valley. It wasn't, it either didn't occur here, um, wasn't as prevalent here and after the war, we just sort of buried the hatchet and move forward in one big happy community. Yeah, sure. It's a it's a great question, and and you know I'll, I'll plug your book for you, Jonathan, right? Because you know you certainly uh, talk about these issues in your book as as well. Uh, and and so, you know, a lot of the early studies of the Shenandoah Valley are, are focused on kind of the pioneer spirit and and you know uh, ethnic immigration to the area, uh, and there is just, just this lack of attention uh, to the African-American experience uh, in the Valley that, that continued well into to, uh, you know, the late 1980s, 1990s. Uh, and so uh, I, I think there is, is kind of a, a sense that somehow uh, the Valley is different. It's not like the Deep South or it's not like other parts of, of the South. And, and I think it's a question of scale. I mean, it, there obviously aren't as many slaves the enslaved in the valley in 1860 as there are in Mississippi or South Carolina or, or you know wherever you want to go, uh, but that doesn't really change the uh, experience. I think in, in in many ways, right? Enslavement is enslavement, whether it's you know in Mississippi or or in the valley or or, or wherever. Uh, and so I think there's just been more focus on 
especially if we look at Civil War historiography, you know, Stonewall Jackson and the campaigns of the Valley and the Valley is the breadbasket of the Confederacy, but but not lots of attention of how that weed is grown and, you know, who does it and, and so on. So I think it's just been uh, ignored largely. So the episode in, in 1868 that you spoke about, I'm curious how unique that was to the Valley. So have you encountered other sorts of, of similar episodes or is this more of an isolated moment? It's a, it's a good question. I, I think it's a question of scale again. Mm -hmm. I think, and as you know, Jonathan, I mean, you can look at the, the Valley during reconstruction and there's lots of one-on-one -on -one violence or, you know, a couple people. There are lots of incidences of black and white violence in the Valley after the war, but usually not to this scale. Uh, and so, and, and they're usually over things just like this. You know, somebody didn't get off a sidewalk. Uh, somebody said something that somebody else didn't care for and it, it led to, to violence. So I think really what I'd like people to take away from this is there is this resentment and I'd say on both sides, right? Uh, and again, not equating those two, but you know, it's a situation that's, that's tense all the time and we just don't see it because it usually doesn't erupt like this. Uh, but any encounter between uh, black residents and white residents anywhere in the valley during reconstruction, I think could lead to, to an incident. Uh, maybe not of this scale, but you know, of violence, if you read through the Freedmen's Bureau records, uh, you know, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, you know, in your, in your remarks, you, you spoke about the Virginia Free Press and Spirit of Jefferson and how they basically tr explained the origins of this, this quite differently. And the Virginia Free Press had, a, you know, was, was very aggressive in placing all the blame on, on uh, the Blacks in Charlestown. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, and I'll make this my last question before we go to Brian and the, and the audience. Uh, if you could speak a little bit to the role of the press in promoting these sort of white supremacist attitudes. That's, that's yeah, uh, definitely. One thing I didn't really get into my paper, uh, and I didn't use a lot of these quotes, but you almost get a sense that the, the press is making fun of this whole thing. You know, that it's it's kind of a, you know, young people kind of going crazy a little bit and, and uh, you know, sometimes not even acknowledging uh, that first incident where, where uh, the black men felt they were insulted by being hit with the sausage casings. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll say it was just some inconsequential act led to this and, and obviously it had consequence to, to someone. Uh, and so I, I think the press tries to shape you know, just like today, uh, how people are going to view something, right? I mean, so uh, I think that they were looking at it as a way to shape the narrative, right? And so uh, talking about, you know, it was debate about whether alcohol was involved. Uh, you know, one of the papers got very upset when it was seemed to be implied that some of the white men were drunk at this time as, as well. And again, if you look at at the, at the trial, uh, the, the initial trial, it was revealed that, that, that two African Americans were drunk. Uh, but if it's a, a harvest day afternoon on a Saturday with people who have lots of money, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of people that were imbibing. But again, I, I think it is just a, a way to try to control the narrative. And they're very clear, right? I mean, those quotes I gave, you don't have to question about how the white community in Charlestown feels about the place of African Americans. They, they're telling us very baldly, you know, stay in your place or, or things like this will happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Brian, do we wanna to go to the audience questions? Absolutely. I'd like to start off by thanking professors Noales and Berkey for their excellent presentations. We've got about 15 minutes uh, left of the session and I'm going to be pulling questions um, submitted from the audience into the chat box. Um, in the order that they were submitted. So we'll start with a few for Professor Noyales and then we'll shift to Professor Berkey. Um, Dr. Noyales, one of the first questions referred to um, General Shaw's quote. Um, he refers to them and going back to that quote, was he referring then to the Confederate Army? Yes, yeah, to the Confederacy in general. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, excellent. And the second question related to records that you use in your research um, surrounding the issue of enslaved persons fleeing um, to Banks's army and to the Union Army in general. Could you speak a little bit about those records and how individuals may have access to them or how they might locate that information? Yeah, so these, these are uh, interesting records that I think Jonathan Berkey and I are the only two who know that these exist, but they're kind of right out there um, in the open. So within General Nathaniel P. Banks's papers at the Library of Congress, um, there is a, a set of um, records for contrabands um, coming into Union lines for the early part of 1862. Um, they're obviously at the Library of Congress. There's a microfilm copy of those records at the Hanley Archives here in Winchester. And, you know, I remember, you know, years ago going through these records and it not only lists, and Jonathan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it not only lists um, enslaved people, but also white unionists as well who were going into Banks' lines. And I remember looking at this years ago thinking, why has no one ever, aside from Jonathan Berkey, um, ever used this before? And, and it's, I mean, it's quite revealing because it, it not only provides, um, you know, that, that testimony about how an enslaver treated them or the intelligence that they offered, but it also provides, you know, their name, who their enslaver was, their age. I mean, it's essentially an oral history. Now, like all oral history, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, allow for a little bit of license and those types of things. But I mean, one of the great challenges in writing about the history of, of slavery is the voice of the enslaved is missing, you know, and it's largely, you know, you're looking at it from a white perspective. And even though it's still a white person reporting this down, um, this is as close as I think you can get in the Valley, aside from, you know, a published memoir of someone like Beth Mevini or John Quincy Adams. Of having that, of having that authentic voice, and it's just shocking to me. I remember the first time I, I I came across these, like you know, you're supposed to be quiet in an archives. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe that. <laughs> I mean, it's in General Banks's papers, which have been called over by historians for years, and and as far as I'm aware, Jonathan, we're the only two who have ever made use of those of those documents. Thank you so much. Uh, another audience member asked, could you please speak to the situation of the free black community in Winchester and Frederick County uh, during the Civil War era? Um, the follow up comment was ancestors named Honesty were living here before and after the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think at times the life for free blacks uh, was even more difficult. Because, again, I think free Blacks understood that their stability, their freedom was protected only so long as, you know, there were United States soldiers in the area. It was not uncommon, and also within the, the Banks papers that I mentioned earlier, it was not uncommon for a handful of free Blacks to be coming from Frederick County or Clark County or Warren County to Harpers Ferry because they feared that Confederates would seize them and impress them in some way into uh, labor for the Confederacy. Uh, free Blacks, of course, played a really prominent role um, throughout the course of the conflict in helping uh, United States forces. Um, one individual that sticks readily into my mind is uh, a fellow whose name was Lee Jenkins. He was from what Stephen City, Virginia today, worked for Robert Milroy. Uh, during the first six months of 1863, was captured um, during the Second Battle of Winchester, was uh, captured by Confederates, was being sent south to work on the Confederate defenses of Richmond. And as the column was marching south from Winchester through Stephen City, um, he ended up breaking ranks, uh, diving headfirst into well committing suicide, because even though he was not enslaved, he knew what slavery was like, he knew what was coming for him. Um, of course, you know, in various parts of, of this portion of the Shenandoah Valley, you have free black communities that existed both, you know, before, during, and of course, more after, um, after the conflict. Thank you. And, and the last question for you, Professor Noyales, and then we'll turn our attention to Professor Berkey. Um, can you speak about the gendered nature of freedom 
um, during this era, uh, maybe the pull of family? Um, were there more males than females that were leaving? Um, and, and also a second part of that question is, was age a prominent factor in the movement towards freedom, uh, elderly versus young and so forth? Yeah, great question. Absolutely. So, you know, when I when I was tracking the movement of, of enslaved people, um, clearly single younger males, you know, late teenage into their, you know, 20s, maybe early 30s, they are the more likelier uh, to flee because they don't have things holding them back. Um, you do have females who flee, but again, I don't think it's anywhere comparable to the to the numbers that you have of you know single you know eighteen to say thirty year old um, individuals. And when you do have um, enslaved males who end up fleeing, there's also instances where they end up coming back if they have family. So the one story that I'm thinking of right now involves uh, an enslaved male from Winchester named Manuel, was enslaved by the McDonald family. He fled to General Banks in uh, some point in the early part of 1862, was driving a, a wagon for General Banks during the first battle of Winchester. Um, Banks's army was driven from the community and he gets a few miles north and he stops and he thinks, well, not only where do I go now, which is something Jonathan and I spoke about in his questions to me earlier, this afternoon, but what happens to my wife and my daughter at the McDonald home in Winchester? So he ended up coming back, waiting for a more opportune moment, which finally came in September of 1862, when Union forces under General Julius White evacuated and went to Harper's Ferry that, that they bolted. But yeah, it's, it's such a very, very complex environment uh, for enslaved people, as well as free Blacks, to navigate. Thank you so much. Professor Berkey, we had a, a couple of questions that related to this question of the prevalence of uh, violence and other incidents um, during the period that you were discussing. One comment, and I, and I think it would be worth addressing, is uh, is there evidence of lynching in this era and in subsequent decades that might shed light on the relationship between Blacks and whites in the lower Shenandoah Valley during the time period that you're discussing? That's a that's a great question. Uh, let me let me address the simple part. I think uh, from looking at at Freeman's Bureau's records on on these incidents, I haven't seen. And maybe Jonathan, you can chime in here as well. I haven't seen any evidence of of what we would really consider a lynching uh, in these records. Is that is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think within certainly within the immediate post war period. Wow. No, um, you know I've come across instances of of murder with you know pistols and firearms, those types of things. There are lynchings that occur in the valley beyond, you know, the traditional frame of reconstruction, um, you know, well into the late 1890s. Right. Yeah, and I, I think, I guess I, the way I would address that, and thank you, Jonathan, I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that the, the press is trying to make this symbolic in some ways, which, you know, if you're talking about a lynching, it's an act of violence that sends a message uh, through communities and, and talks about what, what communities expect and, and value. And so, so I, I think that, that some of that is, is happening here. Uh, but, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, again, this, this was a kind of an instant, instantaneous incident that then the press is trying then to, to bring meaning to uh, and reinforce uh, white supremacy uh, in, in this community. Thank you. A follow-up question related to the quote in one of the newspaper articles that you cited about stay in their place. And the audience member asked if you could expand on the meaning of that quote and how it might have applied more broadly to this um, to this era. Sure. Uh, so it, it's it's actually right a, a phrase that's you know not just in the past, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so the, I, I think what you see is a lot of resentment uh, in Charlestown after the war, uh, you know, freedom and rights for former slaves is, is a reminder of the war. It's a reminder of defeat. Uh, it's a question of social control. And the people in Charlestown, and I think you can, you know, spread that out broader, expect 
the freedmen to behave in a certain way and to acknowledge uh, the, the superiority of their former masters. Uh, and so, uh, again, a lot of these incidents of individual violence that we've been referring to are where, where white people perceive that African Americans are stepping out of some kind of perceived place, not, not moving off the sidewalk, not tipping a hat, uh, not doing something that, that's expected. Uh, and, and so uh, in incidences like this, it just becomes acknowledged and everybody sees it. So this is a message. I mean, one of the things that the, the paper uh, really was proud of is that there was only one town uh, black resident who was involved in the riot. The claim was that everybody else came from the countryside. Now, whether that's true or not, again, is, is a way to try to, to, to spin that community. Uh, and again, this idea of if outsiders would just leave us alone, we wouldn't have problems. I mean, so you see that, you know, that kind of trope uh, right here. Uh, and, and so I think it's these expectations. And if you're an African-American in Charlestown, you got to decide when you're walking down the sidewalk. It's kind of like what Jonathan said. I mean, it's this same navigation, even though emancipation is here, uh, is today the day that I'm not going to get off the sidewalk? And if, if I don't, what's going to happen? And so all these kinds of calculations are being made, I think, every day. And I think it makes for this, this tense situation where at some point somebody's going to say, I'm not going to move off the sidewalk. Maybe they're having a bad day or whatever. And it's going to gonna lead to, to this kind of confrontation. Maybe not with 30 people, but even, you know, even in, a, in a, an individual kind of confrontation. Understood. Thank you very much. And the last question for you would revolve around the transition now from Reconstruction into the Jim Crow era and the discriminatory laws that are enacted in West Virginia during the Jim Crow era. Um, could you speak a little bit about those laws? And then most specifically, were they carrying over or did they carry over uh, into the 1960s into well into the 20th century in West Virginia as they did here in Virginia? Uh, that's a great question. And, and I'm sorry to kind of end on this, but I'm gonna, gonna plead a little bit of, of, of ignorance on that because uh, I don't want to say something that, that's not true. But, but I, I will say that uh, the racial attitudes and uh, Segregation was obviously here in, in West Virginia, as, as in in Virginia, but I, I, I really can't speak to the to the future, you know, uh, future years of, of those laws. Uh, but especially if you're, you know, West Virginia is a big state; it was put together politically. Uh, Jefferson and and Berkeley counties, I mean, they wanted to stay in Virginia, obviously. So I, I don't think there's that much of a of a, of a difference between attitudes and, and laws in Virginia and West Virginia versus this issue of race. But I, I don't think if, if kind of what the question is getting at was, was West Virginia more progressive or was there really a divergent, divergence between the two? I don't really think so. You know, I, uh, there's still massive resistance to, to school uh, desegregation in West Virginia, just like there is in Virginia. Uh, so they might play out a little bit differently, but I think those, I think those attitudes are still there. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for taking those audience questions. And thank you also so much for your presentations. It was an excellent job and I think uh, very enjoyable uh, and informative as well. Uh, I would like to thank the audience one more time for joining us, the Library of Virginia for hosting this session. I would encourage everyone to join our next session on September the 17th at noon as well. Uh, thank you all. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.